Hello and welcome to the ninth ever Talk Tonight podcast. And I've got a special guest for me today. It's the one, yeah. it's the only, official Jihan. It is the one and the only official Jihan, that is correct. There's not another one out there, as far as I know. Notoriously known on Twitter, right, you, Graham? Some might say. Some might say. So, obviously, we go way back. <laughs> we do. Uh, All the way back to the days of the roots of indie Twitter. October, November time of 2018. I believe. Maybe uh, even before that. It could have been. It could have been. It's been a minute, anyway. So, what what do you remember of when we first met? Well, when we first e-met. Um, when we first e-met. All I specifically remember about you is the fact that you constantly posted pictures of uh, you and, like, Alex Turner and other, and, like, Catfish, you know, a different band you've met. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, it was all this. It was all the same kind of serious pose. Uh, I remember that. That's that. That's quite striking in my my memory. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of grew up with that quickly as we uh, we got to know some some indie Twitter nonces. Yeah, you discovered the the temp, the nine pound uh, floral shirts from Primark. <laughs> Changed everything. I heard of a, a lad called Ben Bateman. Ben bloody Bateman, what what needs to be said? Uh, probably the greatest ever nonce to have lived in our in our times on Twitter. I the mean, had... for those who don't know, Ben Ma- Bateman went around there uh, messaging thirteen year olds, fourteen year olds, <laughs> and the guy he had one girl, and that was for nudes. Did he well, ever get them? A few times, yeah. Um, well, if you message over 3,000 people, you're probably going to get a couple of nudes. It's that old saying, isn't it? Yeah. You're throwing off shit at the wall, so yeah, it's going to stick. Right. Um, yeah, because I remember when we, we were doing polls and surveys and all that on Twitter, everyone was working hard tirelessly to find out as much as we could about them. And like, I think it was over 3,000 people said that Ben Bateman had actually messaged them. <laughs> it was like an around-the-clock Twitter scandal. Yeah, well, he had he had 20,000 followers on Twitter, and uh, he followed the same amount. It's like one of those one of those accounts. <laughs> he followed me as well, I remember it. I remember it vividly. Yeah. I remember, like, he, um, when it all came out, a lot of people who uh, we were in a group chat with, yeah, the likes of Alan Johnson, like they'd all been messaged by him. It was just, it was the same thing every time. Uh, do you know what the worst part was? He was never, that? he never messaged me, and that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, how, how about three thousand odd people? How am I not good enough to be solicited for nudes for my big Twitter nonce? Do you know what I mean? Uh, I feel the same, you know. I mean, I'm a what indie Twitter legend. <laughs> well, you wrote the you wrote the fucking handbook on how to be indie. <laughs> Literally, I mean, I've seen all these these wannabes trying to trying to copy me, posting the lists. Think they can buy a dark fruits. But I mean, none of them none of them beat the original. Think they can punch one wall and think they're indie. Try again. Once you've got your nose broken in forty twos, then you can talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've never, I've never sampled the nightlife of uh, Manchester. But, Honestly, uh, don't recommend it. <laughs> it's pretty dreadful. Yeah, it's got people like you know. By <laughs> I hate to name drop. Who's? <laughs> I probably know who it is, but I just. Don't know the the Twitter handle. It, it's a Twitter personality. Uh, your your good friend Samwise is actually very keen on it. <laughs> he actually <laughs> loves it. <laughs> well, anyone that hangs out in an indie club uh, is probably destined for the for the chopping block. 
That's in my in my humble opinion. Glasgow cool. has its own indie clubs as well, but I've never I've never sampled the nightlife for Glasgow either. I'm a bit a bit too young. From what I uh, understand, you're a you're a big fan of indie music, right, Graham? <laughs> well, I guess you could say that is absolutely not true. Or you could say that <laughs> like the word that. Um, no, I am not a fan of indie music, and uh, I think if you follow me on Twitter, you'd be quite aware of that. I, I saw a tweet from you the other day, actually, you saying that you're a big fan of the BMAs. <laughs> <laughs> I just said I hate uh, indie music, but um, allow me to explain that. <laughs> it was what one or two a.m. on a on a Saturday night. Well, it was the Sunday at that point. And uh, <laughs> there'd been a lot of hit of heavy drinking taking place. Oh, call Strad, call Strad. <laughs> and uh, I stuck on play it out when I was in a in an inebriated state, and it uh, and it connected with me on a spiritual level when I was drunk. And I started listening to all the DMA songs, um, like uh, Lay Down, Step Up the Morphine, and all that. And I was like, holy shit, they're the best band to learn the music. <laughs> and, uh, and then I woke up. Realised I tweeted that, uh, and I doubled down on it, uh, and I re-listened to DMAs, and I was back to my opinion of, oh, sorry. Do you know, I mean, when you've had a few to drink, any music sounds good, in my opinion. Yeah, when I've had a few to drink, Mr. Brightside's the greatest song I've ever written, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've never heard a true word spoken. And I will sing not 19 Fibber, every single word, even every single fucking one he is, even that bit. Well, I've had a few drinks in me, so I am co- I'm completely unaccountable for my actions and my words. Yeah, I mean, once you've had a drink, there is no denying that if not 19 Fibber is on, I will scream, heat and fucking park. And if I am at a party where there is a guitar, I, I will unequivocally play one bubble. <laughs> and do you know what? I'm, I'm not even fucking sorry. I am not fucking sorry one bit. So, you say you're not into all this indie music. I do say that. What What do you like? Uh, well, I'm into, like, it's quite eclectic. I say I'm not into indie music, but, I mean, like, I'm not into the kind of generic kind of guitar indie rock that you hear constantly bands like Catfish bands like well I don't mind DMAs because I've had experience I don't bands like Catfish Night Cafe Blossoms Cortinas Cortinas Blossoms yeah it's all just it, it just rolls into one for me and uh, I'm not a fan but what I love in terms of modern music is uh, the punk and post-punk movement coming out bands like Idols bands like Shame and if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know my obsession with Fontaine's DC knows no limits. I mean, from those, I've only really given idols a proper listen. I, I just see Fontaine's DC getting plastered over the timeline. Well, I feel, like, I, I feel like I'm kind of responsible for that. <laughs> I've not really given them time at day. Because ever since I first listened to the first Fontaine's DC song, I remember, like, I love him so much that I remember the exact fucking moment when I first heard uh, Two Real by Fontaine's DC. That was the first one I heard. It was, it was, uh, it was like a January. It was like January, I think. And I heard it. I remember sitting in my room and it fucking blew my mind. And from there, I think I looked at it. I've tweeted over 200 times about them. Wow. Uh, I mean, you've got an obsession. Uh, it is an obsession. And, it, and I can't help it. And I see them on Saturday at Transmit. And that is where my life's going to peak. So you're going to transmit the weekend? Uh, I guess you could say going, or you could say dragged against my will. Are you going to say catfish in the bottom? Man? Uh, most likely no. I'll probably go to the McNuggets experience during that. <laughs> uh, yeah, free so- McNuggets or listening to a shit band. It's, it's a tough call. But they're a brilliant live band, pal. Honestly, like they're so good live. Yeah, but would that not make me like the biggest hypocrite on Twitter? 
<laughs> I went to fucking catfish it and was like, holy shit, this is great. But if if you're uh, one of my detractors, you'll probably it'll probably be because you read my review of the balance. I mean, that review I I actually remember reading that when it when it got posted. <laughs> I had a good time reading that. <laughs> yeah, I had a good time writing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously you don't like Catfish, but did you like any of the songs? Um, if you allow me to consult my uh, my review, I think there was one song that had kind of Mar- Johnny Marr-esque guitar tones that I, that I enjoyed. Um, of course, mate. Of course. Wasn't, any, wasn't any songs that I loved. Well, uh, that's the same for me on the album, to be fair. And I'm, I'm arguably Catfish and Botman's biggest fan. I think it was overlap. I didn't mind. Yeah, really. Yeah. Not one of my favourites. But I mean, uh, literally nothing compelling to me about the band. It, the dull out there. They are dull. Yeah. Encore is, was the other one that I wasn't very harsh on. What did you think of textbook? A textbook? Oh, basically, sorry. Textbook's the opening... <laughs> Weird, and I just get mixed up. I hate hey, that one. Would you like to hear my words at the time? I'd love to. Um, Van McCann stopped singing about Girls Challenge. <laughs> this song's instrumentally a bit more interesting, but vocally and lyrically so bland. The lead guitar is quite good. That's what I said. And that was me being quite nice. I've honestly never heard it put better. It is... Arguably, Catfish in the Bottom is the most bland song for lyrics. And he is an awful lyricist. Yeah, not he because is, he is. Good lyrics because you know the big the big hits from the first album, and like uh, Kathleen and Cocoon, they're fine lyrically. Like song a song like Glasgow, it's 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 a nice song. It's a nice song, well written. It's sentimental. But um, but every single song pretty much is about a relationship, and it gets to a point where you think like, do you not look at the world? Do you not like see how fucked fucked everything is? And do you not want to write about that? Or do you want to write about some girl that your relationship's kind of floundering with? Same could be said for Blossoms as well, because I mean yeah. I can't think of one song that Tom Ogden's written that's not a love song. <laughs> yeah, can't stand it honestly. So, uh, Evelyn Fontaine's DC, Evelyn Idols. What, what, what do you like? I know you're a big fan of Beatles. Yeah, I yeah, the Beatles are like, I don't know, I don't even say I'm a big fan of the Beatles because like it just that is just like part of my personality. The Beatles, um, in terms of like my favorite bands. The White Stripes are like probably my favourite behind the Beatles and Fontaine's DC. Oh, really? Yeah. You don't hear a lot of people talking about them, to be honest. Well, no, they were one of the biggest bands in the world when they were when they were at their prime. I mean, they did split up uh, eight years ago now, but they were like a, f- a fucking great band. Jack White is a genius. I mean, they have released arguably one of the uh, the biggest songs of all time. <laughs> In Seven Nation Army. Oh, in love with the girl. Oh, Seven Nation Army. <laughs> like in, yeah, uh, Seven Nation Army is like, it's not even a White Stripe song. It's it's like Wonderwall isn't an Oasis song. Do I Want to Know isn't a Naughty Monkey song. Like, they yeah, also, I know, I know what you mean. Big, they're bigger than the sum of its parts. Uh, uh, Seven Nation Army is like, it's like, it's like folk music. It's like, it's a people, it's the people's song now. It's not, it's not Jack White's song. Yeah, yeah, just you just hear it plastered over everything. Yeah, well, if you go to a football game, which is oh, I know, I know, it's like it's the go-to chant. It's just because it's so simple, so effective. Yeah, which is, I it's mean, simple. I've how seen you... Jack White talking about how he doesn't let people take phones to his gigs anymore. Yeah, yeah, he's Jack White is fucking crazy. Um. I think on in terms of that, what he does is, yeah, you get a sealed plastic bag with 
and you need to put your phone in that. So you have your phone with you in the gig, so you don't need to worry about it getting stolen. But you just basically can't use it during the gig because it's in a sealed bag. And when you come back out, they unseal it for you. And yeah, I, I, I personally think that uh, this is fucking great. I don't know about you. I mean, I saw in an interview where he was um, talking about it and he was like, oh, I thought it was going to hinder the gig experience massively because people go to gigs now. They want to take photos, want to take videos. But he said yeah. the response has been brilliant. Yeah, well, the way Jack White works his set list isn't like... Well, he doesn't have one. He goes off the... He plays basically going off the vibe of the crowd. So if he, if he like gauges the energy of the crowd he'll play different songs depending on like the kind of mood that he's feeling and when people he says when people are on their phones he can't gauge that energy so he can't formulate like a good set list in his head so for example if people seem to be what feeling a bit bit quiet he'll play one of his bangers essentially yeah yeah, or if like the crowd are going fucking crazy and he's like, yeah, he'll keep up the momentum and he'll think, yeah, I think it's time to slow it down a bit and he'll play like, I can tell that we're going to be friends or something like that. Uh, but he's got such a massive back catalogue that he's got like a wealth of great songs that fit every mood, vibe, feeling that the crowd can present to him. It's, that's actually, <clears throat> that's actually brilliant what he's done there. I didn't know that, but bands should do that, do you know? Because, yeah, it's like cartoons, obviously, they open with notion. <laughs> Everyone Thank goes you. off. But if they then go into, what is it, what's the new one, hanging off your cloud, where it is. Yeah. Just absolutely kills the vibe. We all know the best cartoon song is Heavy Jacket. <laughs> Which I've, I've not the, heard it. You've not heard Heavy Jacket? I've, I've not. Had, I've had the pleasure of seeing them live. Uh, in November, I could, yeah, I could talk forever about that. That was off. That was awful. <laughs> We've got time. We've got time. We do. It's currently, it's currently two or nine a.m. on a on a beautiful Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Let's see. Cortina was at the Hydro in Glasgow in November of twenty eighteen, and it was a shit show. Why? Um. Everything that you kind of stereotype about indie, like indie fans and like crowds, was just was just like it was so true, and it, it gives you such like a bad, leaves you a bad taste in your mouth when you go home. Like Cortinas himself, or like the rest of the band are pretty low energy. Like I don't even know that no, no even nobody even knows their fucking names because they're that boring. They just look like dads. And yeah, like, literally. But, he just stands there, plays his guitar, like the performing monkey that he is. And Liam Frey, giving it a bit of energy, but his voice was shot to shit. Uh, but to be fair to him, like, he, he does what he, 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 give, he delivers on what he sells, do you know? And uh, to his credit, despite him not particularly being a great songwriter or making particularly good music, he, like, he, can, he, can, make, he can put on a good show. But the crowd was fucking awful. The things that he knows he isn't a good singer. He said, he said it himself numerous mm-hmm. times. Yeah. So he relies heavily on like the energy in the room, doesn't he, for everyone to sing it back to him. He can't even sing Not 19 Forever. His voice just can't physically do it anymore. Go that high. So why was the crowd bad? Like, I've not really seen much about this. It was, it was... I mean, I like a rowdy crowd. Like... I've, I've seen Kasabian live and the crowd was crazy at that. Was, yeah, when I saw Kasabian, it was incredible. But the crowd was full of 16, 17, 18 year old boys with their tops off, <sighs> hats on, feeling up girls who were probably 14. And uh, it was just uncomfortable. Like, just like the amount of like groping going on is. It wasn't nice. I mean, uh, you hear about it, don't you? But I've only ever kind of witnessed it once. It was Catfish in the Bottom in Manchester. And just the amount of people with tops off jumping about, and you just think, get get a grip. If you take your top off at a gig, like, 
your human rights should like be thrown straight out the window. Yeah, of course they should, because there's nothing that I want more <laughs> when I'm in a gig than a big sweaty armpit coming at me. <laughs> yeah. And it's never and it's and the boys I mean, I'm one myself, so I'm allowed to say it, are usually fucking fat. Do you know what I mean? And like and you're like realistically like you're so sweaty and you're grubby and you're rubbing your oily body all over me. Like and you're coming up to me and you're hugging me going, I fucking love you, mate. And <laughs> and it's just like get away. It's the last thing you want. You've just gone to a gig to enjoy, you know, some Jerry Cinnamon. Who <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it? Well, Jerry Cinnamon was there, funnily enough. Oh, good. Opening. Are you a fan? Um, well, you know how I said I hate indie music? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Well, I do like Jerry Cinnamon. Oh, really? Yeah, I do. And, like, oh. everything that I say about music, everything that I think about music, but point to me fucking hating him, like... It, mate, it literally would, because I hate him. Yeah, I love him. And I know he's, <laughs> not, and I know he's not good, right? I, I get it. I get why people don't like him, and I agree. But there's just something about him. I just... Maybe, maybe it's because I'm from, from, like, near Glasgow. and I from, can, from the ends. Well, I'm not... Yeah, I guess you could say Yeah. <laughs> I'm not from anywhere remotely near him in terms of Glasgow, though. He's from a completely different part of the... Ne- he's from, from a completely different neck of the woods to me, but he just yeah. sings about life, and he's honest. And good music is about, is about being honest. And whilst he's, like, writing the same song every single time, <laughs> it's just... It's quite endearing. And he's doing it from a place of love. Which is different from, I think, bands like Catfish and Cortinas, where they're doing it from a place of ego and and they're kind of self aggrandizing. They think they have ideas above their station. But Jerry Cinnamon just loves music and he loves performing. Like he's been doing it for over 10 years and only a couple of years ago he rose to prominence. Yeah, it was, I think it was Transmit 2017, maybe. Yeah, he played yeah. on the cut stage. And, it, and his set blew up online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when he played Belter, and um, the crowd just went off. Well, that song, I don't know, I don't know about England, but that song is massive in Scotland. Like everyone here knows the song Belter. For for I mean, all the stick I give Jerry Cinnamon, I can appreciate that he has Rose just on his own, doing it himself, yeah, just no doing what he loves. Right, I got a lot of time and a lot of respect for that. Personally, I don't like his songs because I think when he's going shagging birds and drinking beer, I just think it's boring. But <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, and, I, and I know when he releases a new album, it's going to be fucking awful. <laughs> I like Cantor to be fair, but I don't think I don't. Th- thing is, how 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 how's he going to switch up his sound when his sound is so hard to change? On it, it's just him playing an acoustic guitar. I mean. It, you can't really, can you? No. It's going to be difficult for him, unless unless he's able to write uh, another few bangers. It may be, maybe brings in like a harmonica or something, change it up, but... The thing is, he's got such a great energy, and I saw, and Cantor is a, is, is a great song live. I, I, I really, really enjoy it. But I, think we've, I think we've given him a bit too much airtime. time. Do you think? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, because I think in the, in the grand scheme of music and British culture, he will not be remembered, I don't think. No, nah, I mean, I, I slag off his lyrics, but it's just because I've been brainwashed by Alex Turner singing about a hotel on the moon. <laughs> it yeah, just... you, you know, I think everything has to be a space opera about a hotel. Sorry. He's just so... The, the fact he can write about that just baffles me. Because it, it, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but it, he's such a genius because he, he's it's, it is a concept album and he's created like a... A world, his own world. He's created a whole universe within an album and it's so well thought out and it's so well crafted and interlinked. And it's just... It's, it's, I think it's quite underappreciated, the the genius of the lyrical themes and how they tie in with each other. 
I mean, I'm a big admirer of the album. I've listened to it hundreds of times. Yeah. And quite yeah. quite frankly, I think four out of five is Arctic Monkey's best song ever. Wow, that is It's a bold claim. That is a big big assertion. I I, I feel like on on power star treatment as well, they're they're in the top four for me because just the way he's written them to be so powerful and the lyrics just so Mm. beautiful and the last what two minutes 30 40 seconds whatever a four out of five to build it up and for no one to really know what you're singing about incredible i think it's a song do i want to know wanted to be yeah you know um but like call me a a arctic monkeys hipster but my favorite arctic monkey song is the uh, the blondo sonic shimmer trap it's uh, uh, I think it's a don't sit down because I moved your chair B side. I mean, all the Arctic Monkeys B sides are good. <laughs> I mean, that's just yeah. a well known fact. They've got such a crazy, like, such a crazy amount of B sides. It, it is crazy. And, like, Cornerstone has what, like, four B sides with it? I think it's practically like an EP. Do you like Cornerstone? I actually really don't like it. <laughs> It's just uh, one of those songs I just never really got, got to grips with. It's a song that I'll need to hear live before I die. Do you think? Yeah, well, I've never seen Monkeys. Oh, one of the best days of my life, pal. Hands well, down. I had uh, I was all set to go and see them at Transmit. And then my family booked a holiday. And I had no choice but to go. So, as you can imagine, I had mixed feelings about that holiday. <laughs> And then, and then I saw it was one of the best sets they've ever played in their life. Oh, like, it that, was. It is so, so good. I always see people posting the video of um, I Bet You Look Good on the Dance Floor. And it just warmed my heart knowing that I was on shoulders and the blue smoke you see flying across the stage is from my <laughs> floor. <laughs> yeah, um, I will always be sad that I never saw that. That, like... That rivals the 2013 Glastonbury performance, 2017 the power performance. It's like, it's fucking up there. I mean, obviously I, I saw Last Shadow Puppets before I saw Arctic Monkeys. Mm-hmm. And that was a, a venue which holds 2,000 people. Oh my God. When I saw Last Shadow Puppets and um, Alex Turner came out and he gave it sort of, it, it just, it gave like a short speech on um, David Bowie. He was, was going to... It was after he died, yeah. And he was saying about how the ghost of David Bowie roams these halls. And the end, it turned out David Bowie played the venue Last Shadow Puppets were playing like 30 years before to the day. Oh, my God. And then like, they went into Moon Age Daydream. Yeah, I've heard... I also heard them play Moon Age Daydream. Yeah, I was in what one of the best moments of my life that I was there. <laughs> Just it, incredible. Alex Turner has always wanted to be David Bowie. Oh, I mean, just the way he moves on stage. And Julian Casablancas. Like <laughs> he's torn between what what are the two he wanted to be. The the things that you know, he wants to be them and then he writes like John Cooper Clark. Yeah, and then he and then he realizes that he's infinitely better at writing lyrics than Julian Casablancas will ever be. Oh, too right. Uh, I think is this it is better than any Arctic Monkeys album, but every other Arctic Monkeys album literally shits on any other Strokes album. So it's a, another bold claim. <laughs> that I'm not really given the Strokes enough time. I think is that it, well. I first heard "Is This It" when I was fourteen, and it like blew me away. I just listened to it, like on repeat, on repeat, on repeat, and that's how I got into indie music and then moved away from indie music. <laughs> you got to start somewhere. Yeah, well, we all love Oasis, and then we all love Arctic Monkeys, and then we all grow out of Oasis, but we all still always love Arctic Monkeys. That's what always happens. I feel like I had a, a weird dissension because 
when I was little, my dad like bought Arctic Monkeys albums when they came out, and the Kaiser Chiefs were big at that time. Razor Light, the Killers. So I was listening to this when I was like young. I and then never... I got into pop music. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've never been exposed to to like indie music or Britpop or anything like that isn't pop music because I'm not from a musical family. Which is kind of weird considering. Surprises me considering yeah. you, uh, you play guitar. Who, who inspired you to play guitar? Um, Slash from Guns N' Roses. Oh, really? Yeah, when I was seven. One of the greatest. I got an iPod for Christmas when I was six, I think. No, when I was seven. And then that following, I also got a guitar and I started listening to Guns N' Roses. I was like, holy shit, Slash is the man. What, what's your favourite Guns N' Roses song? Well, I don't really like them anymore. Like, I only listen to only listen to Sweet Child of Mine. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, Welcome to Paradise. And I was like, oh, he's so good at the guitar. <laughs> and I picked up an acoustic guitar when I was seven. And I got lessons for about a year. Two, maybe two, two years. And I was like, what the fuck? How can I not play uh, the solo of Sweet Child of Mine yet? Yeah, even though you've only been playing two years and you're nine years old. <laughs> But yeah, after the age of about nine or ten, self-taught, but everything else. That's fair enough, man. I mean, I know from uh, what I've seen that you are actually a good guitar player. I'm all right. Do you think you'll uh, do anything with it? Well, yeah, I'm hoping some sometime in the near future to form a band, which is written up to like 30 songs. Nice, very nice. Obviously, this uh, this podcast will publicise that if we've got any takers. <laughs> yeah, uh, if there's any record record uh, in our men listen to this podcast. Oh, there'll, there'll be a few. There'll be a few. If you're still listening at this point in the podcast, then fair fucking play, because this is probably like a sleep deprived descent into madness. <laughs> It's been one of the longest podcasts I've done. I think it's probably a good point to uh, to end the podcast. I think it probably is. Anyways, Graham, it's been a pleasure. It really has shooting the shit about uh, the cesspit of Twitter. So, uh, I'm sure I'll have you on again. Yeah, it's very true. So if you've uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, leave a like, subscribe. Cheers.